Hey guys, this is Toby Mathis and Jeff Webb, and this is Tax Tuesdays. Um, hey, we're bringing tax knowledge to the masses, and today we got a really jammed one. Uh, just can't help it. Uh, hey, there's somebody who's doing the Protect Wealth Cruise. Yeah, I'm not going to be on that. Boo. Hey, we got a lot to go over today. We got a ton. We got a ton. First off, you know you can ask questions via the little question and answer thing on the uh, GoToWebinar. And uh, we do see it. We're going to try to keep them relevant to what we've been going on. Uh, da, 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 da. Somebody just already asked. I've been logging my real estate professional hours. How do I explain it to my CPA? Well, you shouldn't have to. They should understand what tax professional is. If they don't, you should actually switch CPAs. You don't want someone learning on your dime. Um, but anyway, let's jump off of that. Somebody, yeah, I know. There's a few people that are already ticked off. Um, no, that's just the truth. You just you don't want them to, to have to, you don't want to teach somebody because there's other things that they need to be able to do and you don't want them learning and doing it wrong on yours and then figuring it out. All right, uh, we always talk about that stuff. I'm trying to fast forward this thing, here we go. All right, so let's jump into Tax Tuesday. First off, uh, I do put these up on, uh, on our podcast. I'll share where those are, but there's tons of videos uh, both at YouTube and Facebook. You can come in, you can like us on Facebook, you'll get a ton of content. And then on your, your YouTube channel, it's just jam packed. I take every tax Tuesday. I think we're into the 90s at this point. Yes, we, we are. We break out the questions. We, we, we take bits and pieces of each one and make them into separate videos. So like you could just go in there and have a smorgasbord. There's, there's a good chance that we've answered the questions that you're thinking of. Um, here we go, Tax Tuesday rules. If you ask live, we're going to do our very best to answer before the end of the webinar. You can send your questions at any time. And I do say this at any time. We compile them um, during the weeks between. Like we do these every other week, the Tax Tuesdays. And during that middle area, we compile the questions that we're going to answer on the next one. That's why they keep getting longer. Um, if you need a detailed response that's very specific to you, like you want actual advice, you're going to need to be a tax client. Uh, or platinum, and there's ways to do either one of those. Platinum is probably our, our our number one service that we provide at Anderson, which is uh, you join platinum and 35 bucks a month. You can ans ask any tax question, but you can also get on the phone with lawyers and advisors to help answer your questions, to noodle things out. Uh, tax Tuesday is fast, fun, and educational. We like to get as much information out there as possible. Some accountants jump on, which is great. Uh, we do teach a lot of things that are, uh, that are uh, a lot of our classes are already approved for continuing education. So if you're an accountant or an attorney and you're on the call, I don't think these ones qualify, no. but there's a number of ones I could forward to you that, that do qualify for your hours. And of course, if you come to, uh, if you come to the tax and asset protection class that we teach, it's three days, and gosh, in some cases it's 20 hours. It's, it's quite a bit. I have to ask Valerie what the, depending on your state, but most of them are approved. We have several of the courses that are approved, both for continuing education for realtors, continuing education for accountants, continuing education for attorneys. Uh, so if you're a professional, we can uh, we can uh, get it up. Um, boy, lots of questions already rolling in. And here's an easy one: Is the once a year rollover from an IRA to a Roth 12 months? Or does it have to be exactly 365 days? When you're actually you're actually um, you're actually mixing a couple of ideas there. You can do a rollover once every year, uh, 365 days, which is means I take money out of my IRA that would ordinarily be taxable, but I put it back in within 60 days. So there's a lot of people that say, oh, you can take a 60 day loan. No, you can roll it over. Um, as far as the converting a traditional to a Roth, you can do that all over and over and over again. And at the end of the year, you're just saying. What did I take out and convert over to the Roth and pay tax on? Yeah, so that 365-day rule or 12-month rule means um, that's not trustee to trustee. That isn't going from TD Ameritrade directly to Fidelity. That's that's they're issuing a check to you, and then you're putting the money somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, and that you can only do once a year. So if you do one on April 1st, you can't do another one until the April 1st of the following year. Yep. But the, the trusted trustee, trustee, you can do those. You can do that over and over and over again. Yep. So, but And at the end of the day, what it really matters is if I take a traditional taxable uh, Roth, and I mean, uh, IRA and convert it to a Roth, that just means I'm taking it from my traditional account, putting it in my Roth account. I'm just going to pay 
uh, tax on that. I'm going to end up. What, what, what's the form they give you? The uh, um, is it a 1090? No, there's or, a 5498 or something. Oh like yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. 5498. So the pre-tax that tells you what contribution. the contribution is. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, so that's a form that says pre-tax or post-tax contribution into your into your Roth. Uh, somebody says trying to start a real estate business, but I don't know how to have the LLC tax. Of course, there's something else. Brianna, that's what we're here for. Uh, you're going to want to, and so I'm going to say this to the uh, to Susan or to Patty. I would grab Brianna's information and get them to an advisor because LLCs uh, get to choose how they're taxed, and it really comes down to your unique situation as to whether or not you want it taxed as a disregarded entity, meaning the federal government ignores it and it's taxed to the owner. So if the owner is a C-Corp, taxes is flowing through onto the C-Corp return. If it's an individual, then that would be under the individual's tax return. If it's a partnership, then the partnership follows the return and gives K-1s to its owners. S-Corp, same thing. It passes the profits and losses down to its owners. So you have choices. So the uh, LLC is a state entity and it's a Swiss army knife. Uh, but let's jump into the opening questions. So let's see, um, see if I can actually do this. Fast forward, oh, my thing doesn't like to work. Um, let's see, there we go. How do I handle my general contractors W9 at the end of the job so I don't have to create a problem for my accountants? So that's so nice of you. You know, you're We appreciate about. that. Um, I jointly own a property 50% with my cousin. Is it taxable then if he quit claims the property to me? We'll answer that. What is the simplest way or software to maintain vehicle mileage logs? I have a great recommendation for you on that one. In general, when is it better to have your taxes flow through on your personal return versus using an LLC being taxed as an S or a C Corp? That's the beautiful part. We'll, we'll, we'll get into that. That's kind of a fun issue there. Is buying a property to use for Airbnb a profitable plan? Uh, can you invest the money earned through a 501c3 to invest in dividends and stocks? Uh, can you explain the 100% depreciation changes in the new tax code? Bonus depreciation. And how they can best be used. I started an LLC and have no employees or income coming in. Okay, I'm married and filed jointly. Can I claim business expenses on my taxes? We'll answer that one too. We have several uh, S. FH, so I think a single family home, single family yeah, yeah, properties that need to be put in LLCs. Do they each get their own LLC? Uh, we usually call them SFRs, by the way. If I move into one of my rentals for a year and a half, that's in its own LLC. Does the LLC does the LLC still depreciate it and deduct repairs? So basically, uh, if I move into my rental and I live in it as a personal residence, do I depreciate it? Uh, which is the best entity to use to pay yourself from a house flipping business? How do we structure our health care through our corporation to be able to write off things like gym memberships and doctor visits? It's an interesting one. Can I deduct ed educational training costs pertinent to the company mission within an LLC framework if I file as a C-Corp? Uh, am I retired? Uh, I am retired if I am. <laughs> this is horrible. I am retired, drawing Social Security in retirement. Do I need to pay myself a salary for my corporation and all of the associated withholding in federal and state taxes, or would I be able to simply pay myself a distribution of the profits, dividends perhaps? We will answer those. What happens if a real estate property is gifted to an immediate family member and the recipient sells the gifted property within two years? Does the tax liability fall on the donors or does the recipient just file it on the recipient's return? Great question. We're going to answer that. And how do I start funding a solo 401k? And do solo 401ks have to pay UBIT or UDFI if they finance real estate? Uh, we'll answer those as well. And you'll understand what UBIT and UDFI are by the time we're done. So let's jump into the first one. This is you being very kind to your account. How do I handle my general contractor's W-9 at the end of the job so I don't create problems for my accountants? So, Jeff, you, why don't you explain what a W-9 is and kind of give them the, the lay of the land. So a W-9 is a form that you give to your vendors, uh, every vendor you have that you make payments to, that identifies who they are, um, who is a taxable, who, who, who reports the income. Uh, now, what's key with these W-9s is uh, 
you don't want to, you want to have this W-9 before you pay them a single penny. Uh, the problem is, is with a lot of vendors is you pay them and then you request the W-9, uh, you're not going to get it. Yep. They have no reason to give it to you. It's, I have that t-shirt. Um, years ago, one of our businesses was a, uh, was one of 50,000, what was it? A, a sampling. It was a random, uh, audit mm -hmm. for payroll. Let's see if I can get my words out today. Um, where what they did is the IRS looked to see how big the problem was of employees being classified as contractors. And so they'd go into businesses and I, I don't, I don't know how they picked them, but they were all mid-sized businesses. So they were all between, you know, a few million dollars and probably 50 million, somewhere in that range. So they wanted to see some activity. And, uh, it was about a week that they sat in our office and they went through each W-2, which, which means a W-4, uh, when you, when the employee's filling it out and all the W-9s. At the end of the day, there were two contractors that we had paid over that period of time, I think it was a three-year audit, that we did not have the W-9s on. One was a magician for a Christmas party and he was on America's Got Talents. Like he was actually a name, I won't go over his name, but I could not get him. He like made his W-9 disappear and I could not get him. Because he was a magician. I could not get him for the life of me to actually sign that dang document. And the IRS said, well, you can't prove that he was a corporation. Because technically uh, when you 1099 somebody, you don't have to 1099 a corporation. Um, it was so annoying. And then we had a, uh, a landscaping business that had gone out of business and we couldn't prove what they were because they were bankrupt. There wasn't anybody to act on behalf of the company or sign anything. So they made us pay the withholding on us, 28%. It was the total amount that we ended up writing them a check was 750 bucks, right around in there. And I said, if I, if I write the check, do you go away? <laughs> there he is. So I wrote him the <laughs> check, but it was uh, one of those things where if, if you don't keep track of this, it could be a real bear for you because how do you 1099 them if you don't have a W-9, you don't know what their information is. And so uh, if you ever get audited, that becomes your very best friend. So if you're paying somebody money, Jeff, you get that W-9 first, right? Get the W-9 first. Yeah. Um, and I would even recommend, especially in the case of contractors, um, construction contractors, that unless you're sure they're reputable, I would get it from them as soon as I contract with them. Yep. And you only need to get it once. That's the thing. So what I do is I say, hey, when, you, when they send the invoice over, just get in the habit of before you write the check, saying, hey, will you sign this W-9? Because if you haven't paid them yet, they're pretty quick to, pay, to sign it. And all it is, it's a one-page form. Like, I should pull one out. But it's it's literally, if you just Google W-9 IRS. Yeah, you list your name, EIN or Social Security that's number, it. address. It, it's literally like three or four lines. It takes two minutes to fill out. And then <laughs> you don't have to worry about it. Now you're reporting that income to them so you can take the deduction. Um, is, the, is there an amount annually that you have to pay contracted required W-9. Uh, Tony, if you're if you're paying somebody anything more than 600 bucks, you need to 1099 them. In order to 1099 them, you need their W-9. So um, I would say 600 would yeah, that, I, technically it's any dollar, right? Yeah, the problem comes is if you pay them $500 this time and then you have to call them back later in the year for something else and it's another $500. Well, now yeah. they, they're over the threshold for, uh, requiring a 1099 yeah and if they're a corporation uh they still have to fill one out they just mark a box that says they're a corporation which means you don't have to file a 1099 yeah which is great like again so what jeff is saying is that if you're a corporation the people don't have to 1099 you and vice versa if you're paying a corporation it says inc and you get a w9 and they say they're a corporation you don't have to 1099 them it makes life a lot easier uh, unless you like sending lots and lots of W or uh, 1099s out in January. In a 1099, by the way, you're just saying, here's what I paid you. And that way the IRS knows that contractor got paid and they're looking for that income on their return. Um, and you get to write it off. If you don't, then you're going to have to prove that expense. And you can show them a check, in which case they have two choices. They could say, all right, you get the write off, but you should have done withholding and you didn't. So we're going to charge you that money. Uh, or you get the W-9 and show you that you weren't required to. Then you don't have to worry about it. So you always get that W-9. That's your best friend. 
get it before they uh, you pay them. Um, otherwise, it's good luck getting it from them. People will drag their heels on that one, especially if they're not reporting their income. All right, I jointly own a property 50% with my cousin. Is it a taxable event if he quit claims the property to me? Jeff, what do you think? Uh, this is a gift. So it is a taxable event, but it's a taxable event to your cousin. Uh, if it's more than $15,000, he has to file a gift tax return. Yeah, and what it is is how long, how big is our, our lifetime gift amount that we so can- 11 million, 840. Yeah, so for eleven million dollars that I can give to somebody, I can give Jeff eleven, uh, Jeff 11 million dollars next week. He doesn't have to pay tax on it. I don't have to pay tax on it. So if you have, um, you know, so if, if depending on the property value and what your actual amount is, you know, uh, your cousin, uh, if he gives you the property, you're going to have to value that gift. Right. If it's Pretty close to the purchase. I'd, I'd probably just use that if it's within a year. If it's you've owned it for a while, then if it's more than fifteen thousand, uh, by all means, it's a seven sixty eight. I forget the formula. Seven oh nine. Seven oh nine. So Jeff's a an idiot savant. <laughs> um, no, you pop, pull that one out. Seven oh six. So you file a gift tax return, and you say, "Here's how much of my eleven million dollars or whatever it is that I'm, I'm using up right now." So you're allowed to make gifts. Uh, what is a quick claim? That is a transfer of interest in a county record of whatever my interest is. A quick claim is what you use when you don't really care whether you have a bunch of liabilities. It's I'm giving you whatever, I'm quitting my claim against this property is all I'm doing. So I'm just giving you my, my right. If you're doing a, a, a transfer where you want there to be, um, some representation on it, then you're doing a warranty deed. So we always recommend warranty deeds. Like title insurance is going to require a warranty deed. Um, but if I just quit claim it over, like I'm joint tenants with right of survivorship, and somebody quit claims over and, and extinguishes their rights, then you're not going to, you shouldn't have a problem. If it's tenants in common, where we each own an undivided 50%, then uh, that quick claim is just basically that's it. No warranties are made with that. They're just saying, hey, whatever I have in this, I'm giving it to you. I'm not saying that I have, you know, perfect ownership. So there might be something out there on that title. However, uh, word of warning, a quick claim does surrender your interest, but it does not relieve you of any debt on that property if there is debt and you're yep. maybe on the hook for it. Yeah, so you're quitting your interest. That's it. So you're not saying, hey, there's no deeds or no liens against it. It's kind of fun. Um, Don's asking, hey, Don. Um, it's Don is asking, is there no limit per person per year on the gifting? No. So, so I have a lifetime gift that I can make. Um, 2019, it's 11400000 $400,000. But if I don't want to do a gift tax return, then my limit is $15,000 per person, and that's per spouse. So uh, if my cousin gifts me their interest in the property and the property is worth $100,000 and you have an $80,000 lien against it, then your cousin's interest is worth one half of that $20,000 or, or $10,000. And if they give that to you, you don't have to do a gift tax return. If there is no debt and they give you $50,000 of interest, so you have a $100,000 property and they give you 50% of it, then you would do a gift tax return for $50,000, which would mean that your cousin, and it's, it's not just cash, it's anything of in, a, a value of, of $15,000, by the way. But if they gives you that interest in the property, then they would do a 709. 709. And it would say basically, hey, I'm using up 50,000 of my lifetime gift exclusion of 11,400,000. And that annual exclusion really confuses a lot of people. They think that's the most that they can gift. No, you can give a lot more. You just have to report it. You just have to say, hey, I just gave Jeff $100,000. Um, I can give him the 100000 I just have to say it's ordinarily the IRS wants to tax transfers of wealth. So if I give Jeff a big chunk of money, they want to know about it so that they can calculate it because they don't want, for example, Bill Gates giving away billions of dollars to to, to people that now is not taxable. They'd rather be part of his estate. 
so that they can tax it when he dies. When I say they, it's Congress that writes the laws, but it's the uh, Treasury that gets it. So uh, here we go. Somebody says they got it. All right. So what is the simplest way or software to maintain vehicle mileage logs with the least effort? So on this one, I have a very personal view on this. It's Mile IQ is the app. Mile IQ, and wait, 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 we want to go back to the very beginning of what these rules are. So either the company owns the car and you're taxed on the personal use, or you own the car and you get reimbursed by the company for the company's use. And there's two ways to do that. It can either reimburse you the actual cost that you incur on that vehicle and that percentage. So if I'm driving it 30% for business and my actual cost of owning that vehicle, at the end of the year, I calculate all the gas, the repair bills and everything else is $3,000, then the company would give me 900 bucks, 30% of 3,000. Um, if I do the mile mileage, then it's a flat rate, I forget what it is right now, 58 cents or 50, yeah, 58 cents per mile, and you reimburse the miles. Now, in either case, I have to keep a mileage log. If I own the, the vehicle personally, I just have to keep a mileage log, and it's a pain. It used to be you'd have a physical little book that you'd write down, a beginning odometer, ending odometer on a business trip. Now, you use Mile IQ, it's real easy, and it GPSs you and says, is this a business? I think you swipe left, I could open it up, <laughs> look, but you, you swipe left or right, depending on whether it's a business trip or a personal trip, and if you swipe business enough on a certain trip, it's gonna say, hey, do you want me to keep track of that one? For example, if I drive between offices or my home office to one of my offices here, it already knows that that's a business trip. I don't, it doesn't even ask me anymore. It just automatically tracks it, and then I can use that. Um, somebody asked a question on the back one, on the last question we had. Do you have to do a gift tax return if the gift is not cash regardless of the amount? No, it's only if the value exceeds fifteen thousand dollars and by the way if a husband and wife they each get fifteen thousand dollars per recipient so if you have two kids you can give thirty thousand dollars a year to each one of them so a mom and dad can contribute to son and wife yep. uh, fifteen thousand to each totaling the sixty thousand dollar gift that does not get reported yep so yeah so you're getting it uh back to the you. Um, you know you got it Every, there's people actually answering oh, okay. that they're also getting it uh, I hope you got it. How long have you been a CPA? Like, uh, not quite 30 years yet. Jeez, newbie. Um, all right, what's the simplest way? Is my IQ. So I'm just going to answer that one again. And if you need a, if you need that emailed to you or something, I'm sure we can get it out to you. Yeah, because with you, it doesn't. Open. It doesn't depend. I mean, it's going to work the same way whether you own the car or the company owns the car. You need the same information. Yeah, a lot of accountants, they do this weird thing where they, they buy their car in the via, in the uh, company name, which is no good in my world, just because nine times out of 10, the insurance alone makes it not worth it, because now you have commercial insurance. Um, it gets kind of stinky, so you don't, like, you want to do that. So personal is left, business is right when you're on the mile IQ. And it'll literally tell you how many miles you drove and how much that's worth to you. So like I'm looking at one right now that was 7.8 miles and it's $4 and 52 cents. There we go. That's a business. That's a business. Yeah, I just love doing business. So I'm looking at them all and it just tracks them. You just know that you're being tracked. What is the name of this app to track mile again? Uh, mile IQ. Just go to the app store. And I'm, I'm sure there's it's, other. It's very popular. My IQ is. Yeah. So like you'll you'll see it. Just just you could also Google. Somebody just did mileiq.com. Uh, Doug Schomburg, thank you, bud. I'm trying to figure out how to do that. I'm going to send this out to everybody if I can. Oops. Paste. Oh no. This is crazy. I just did something weird. Mile IQ, so it's just M-I-L-E-I-Q. <laughs> I'm just gonna respond to uh, Doug. MileIQ.com. But, you know, if, if you, you know, you just uh, send to all, there we go. I think I sent that all to everybody. Uh, fantastic, let's jump on to the next one. Um, 
somebody just said type in mile IQ and the Google Play Store comes out on top. Thank you very much. Yep. So that so there you go. So that's an easy one. Uh, but it's one of those weird things where accountants go in there and they'll have you buy a car in your business because they can write it all off. They think, oh, I'm going to write off the whole car, but you are taxed on your personal use. And if it's less than 50%, the whole thing is taxed, but you don't get to write it all off. So these accountants are nuts that do it unless you are using that car for business more than half the time and you plan on doing that for at least five years. Because if you go below 50% during that depreciation period and you wrote it all off even in year one, it's all recapturable as, as ordinary income. Plus, your personal use on that, there's a schedule they release every year, the IRS releases it, that says based on the value of your vehicle, here's how much you have to include in your tax return, depending on how much personal use you had. So there's a tax hit subject to withholding, and I just say it's not worth it. So I, I, I get it over and over again. And uh, brilliant accountants are going out there and trying to do 100% use. I'm telling you, that's an audit trigger. You're going to get wasted, and it's going to be very painful for you because most of my clients are investors. A lot of them are real estate folks, but they have personal use on that vehicle, and they're not they're not capturing it. The accountant's saying 100%. It's just that's just not real. Uh, if you have a vehicle for your construction business that has your name on the side and you're using it for business and it stays at your location and you're just using it for business only and you never drive it on the weekends you're not using it to go home then that's a different story but uh but that's that's not it um if you're using the 58 cents a mile method is there any tax implication uh using the vehicle 50 percent or more nope rick it doesn't matter if i use it 100 percent uh for personal and uh, and I, I use it 100 miles for my business, it can still reimburse me those miles. It'll give me 58 bucks. Uh, somebody else says, what about a lease? That's actually the valuation that the IRS releases every year. They say, if your car is worth 50,000 bucks, for example, the lease value is $12,000. And if you use it for half, you have to include $6,000 in your taxable income. And it's like you got paid wages. So it stinks. So. Um, See, somebody says, I like Kiss. I like him too, Gene Simmons. <laughs> All right. I don't think that's what they meant, but okay, uh, go ahead. Uh, could we postpone required minimum distribution to 72 years of age, uh, 70 and a half? Uh, can the company actually, can reimburse actual expense for the auto business use? Yeah, it can actually, but it's, remember, it's only the business portion. So let's jump on to the next one. In general, when is it better to have your taxes flow through on your personal income versus using an LLC being taxed as an S or C corp? Jeff, what strikes you as odd in that question? Oh, um, well, we when I read this, I, I wasn't really sure what they were doing. Um, and if it's an S corporation, it is going to flow through to your personal exactly. income. So, so remember, and you guys can be really snotty about this because. There's actually a law professor blog where all they do is make fun of judges who call limited liability companies, limited liability corporations. And I'm, and I'm not joking. They literally call them out on every single opinion and make fun of them. Um, but an LLC is a state taxable entity. It is not a tax type. Your LLC is ignored to the IRS. So you can have an LLC. And when you say S or a C Corp, an S flows through, a C Corp doesn't. Now, when is it better to have the flow through? In my world, it's when you can't control the income. It is when I'm going to have unfettered income coming to me that I need to use to live off of. Then I'm probably going to go with an S-Corp, but that does not mean that I just have to have an S-Corp. I may have a management company like a C-Corp and, uh, and, and use both. I may say, hey, I'm going to do all my high-end management. For example, I may have a C-Corp uh managing my llc being the manager of an llc and i could have an llc tax as a c corp managing an llc tax as an s corp or tax as a partnership doesn't matter but um when it's better is usually when you're living off the income when uh, yeah, right. because if i if i don't need the money and i already have enough income coming through i have a spouse that's making w2 income that c corp tax bracket is really attractive it's it's 21% so let's say Jeff is making several hundred thousand dollars a year 
has a spouse who's making another several hundred thousand and says, really, we don't need the money from second spouse. Let's just keep it in a C-Corp. Well, the C-Corp does not have to pay you a salary. It could just sit there and, and stockpile cash if it has a, has a use for it. In real estate, you always have a use for it. So we can cut our tax bracket significantly just by doing that, especially if you're in a state like California, New York, Connecticut, Maryland, all these uh, state tax places, it's so much better. Uh, so, you know, so at the end of the day, there's three rules to tax. I get a little cheeky with it, but I'll say this. Um, the rule is calculate, calculate, calculate. There's three rules and they're all the same, which is just get your pencil out and have somebody run a quick test. Now, I will say this, flow through entities right now have something called QBI which is a 20% deduction on the income that flows through under certain circumstances. That was under the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. So we have to calculate that. So when you look at these things, a lot of times we, they, you know, our knee-jerk reaction is to do the simplest approach. What you really have to do is kind of sit down with somebody for 30 minutes, be disciplined about it and say, this is what I expect. And then they can run different scenarios. Uh, somebody asks, if you have a C-Corp and an S-Corp, do both need to pay a salary? The answer is no. And realistically, neither one has to pay a salary. There's a misnomer about S-Corps having to pay a salary. What the rule is, and you could actually, I just dealt with this with, an, with, with somebody yesterday. The rule is that if that the amount that you take as um, income, as wages, is only there dependent on how much you actually take out of the corporation. So it cannot exceed what you take out or, you know, it, it, technically it can, but from a forced taxation standpoint, it's not going to exceed what you take out. So if I take out a thousand dollars out of an S corp, there's a good chance that that's all going to be wages. If I take out zero from an S corp, I'm going to have zero wages. Even if the corporation made a hundred thousand dollars, and this is going to make some of the accountants out there, this is going to make their eyes twitch. But if you look at the rule, you'll see both in the code and in the, and in the IRS, uh, uh, they, they put out a fact sheet and they have a, um, what was, I think it was either, gosh bless it, it was either an opinion. They give guidance and they said that in the case of an S corp that distributes profit, there has to be a reasonable salary. Now let's flip that around. In the case of an S corp that does not distribute profits, it does not have to. And that's actually the rule. So it's kind of cool. Uh, somebody says, does qualified business income apply to rental income from properties held personally? Uh, the answer is yes. If it's on your schedule E, it counts Ross, even if it's not in an entity. Uh, so I hope that that answers your your, your question and the only type of rental activity, and this is, by the way, there's a lot of confusion on this because the IRS at first put in their written response that you could not take QBI against rental income. Yeah, they originally said it wasn't a trade or business, so it wasn't yep. qualified. Then they got blown up. I shouldn't say blown up. I'm, that's inciting, right? No, uh, yeah, then they. So so they, they came out with an additional ruling saying for this, for QBI only, it can be considered a trade or business. Yes. And the only time you, and you have two types of, of, of income, of uh, rental activity, by the way, you have to keep them separate. Uh, personal, residential, meaning personal and residential versus commercial. Yeah. Okay, and, yeah. and when you have commercial, if you have triple net leases, that's not trader business income. It's not for QBI. So if you're doing triple net leases on a, on commercial property, you're not gonna get the 20% deduction against it. If you are renting single family residences to people, you're going to get it. And they gave us these weird 250 hours, some bizarre stuff, yeah. ignore all that. I shouldn't sell the room. I, I think that if you are in the business of, of, of having rental properties, you're gonna be fine. The IRS is trying to scramble eggs on us sometimes. Um, they don't like it they get it anyway so uh what's the answer to i think we went around the world on that one uh, yeah what is it better to have your taxes flow through 
if I am a, let's say I'm a contractor or I'm a dentist, uh, lawyer, consultant, whatever, and I live off of my income, I'm probably going to be an S corp. And then I may have a C corp somewhere out there for other activities or for managing. Um, but I'm probably going to have that be a flow through. If I have a spouse who has a high W2 income, I'm probably going to be a C corp and I'm going to stockpile that money. So hope that answers your question. I wish it was easy, Jeff. Actually, we'd be out of it. I was just going to say that. So God bless them. 20,000 pages. Uh, is buying a property to use for Airbnb a profitable plan? What do you think? Uh, you do returns all day long, right? Yeah, but it depends on so much that doesn't have anything to do with tax. Uh, <laughs> I just like that's why I threw that in there. I just thought it was like somebody asked like a, what was it a few months ago? What's a good safe return that gives you ten percent or something like that? I, oh I, I, yeah. yeah. I'm so like, I, well, if I knew that, I'd be retired right now. Right? So I, I think this is more of a case where you really have to do your work on what you can actually collect in rents and how often you can rent it. And uh, so if you got a place on a beach, you're probably going to be able to collect a lot more. It's going to be a more profitable. We have proposition. a client. We have a client who's getting almost three hundred thousand dollars a year for the Airbnb on his property on a beach. It's fantastic property. But here's the deal. The reason I threw this in here is because your calculation needs to be accurate. And when you're an Airbnb, that's a hotel. If if your average rental is seven days or less, you are not a rental anymore you have become an active trader business you're you're you are now a hotel and you lose the ability to depreciate you lose installment sales you lose 1031 exchange you lose a lot of stuff and all that income is you, you can't depreciate against it so it's all ordinary income subject to self-employment tax so you're going to get a little extra tax on there and there is a workaround we have done videos on this. So rather than, I'll give you the, the 30 second view and then I'll say, we did a whole series on this. If you want it, email in and I will send it to you for free because we love you. But what it is, is if you have an Airbnb, that is an active business. And if I still want my depreciation, here's how you do it. You take your hosting and you move it into a corporation. So the host, is an entity and the courts recognize it as another person so basically me and jeff jeff is the host jeff is going to go out on airbnb and he's going to rent the property over and over and over again to lots of people um people are putting up their their their, their emails patty you can go grab those uh what we'll do is we'll send it out probably with the follow-up email too um why don't we do that now that way you guys all get it so here's how it works. So Jeff is the corporation, and let's say he's a C-Corp. This is a good example. Mm -hmm. And Jeff goes out to the world and says, I got this great property. Well, Jeff doesn't have access to the property, so he rents it from me and says, Toby, I want to be able to rent that property from you. Um, and what he does is he rents long. On a monthly basis or on an annual basis, he rents the property from me. I'm Toby LLC that owns a rental property. Now I can depreciate, I can treat it as an investment property for the amount of rent that Jeff pays me. And then Jeff is only taxed on the amount of income that he makes that is the difference between the rent that he generates and the rent that he pays. I hope that makes sense. So you're gonna get your, um, you're going to get all of your depreciation. And poor Patty, you are just getting slaughtered right now. There are literally pages of emails coming in. I'm so bad. Um, and we'll send that out. So we'll make sure that you guys all get access to it. I probably just ticked off my entire tech staff. Sorry, guys. Um, I do this about once a month. Where I, I managed to tick them off and take down the websites and do all sorts of fun stuff. There's a lot of you guys out there. Um, what is she doing? She sent my like poor Susan. She could probably send it out on the chat feature too. Uh, so you poor guys. Um, why cannot the Airbnb hotel, why can they not depreciate? Because it is an active trader business and an active trader business does, are not an investment and they cannot depreciate their stuff, it's inventory. So I cannot depreciate the inventory. If I have a mini mart and I buy Cheerios, 
I do not get to to uh, I do not get to uh, depreciate the Cheerios. That's my inventory. If I'm on a car lot, I don't get to write off the cars until I sell them. It's cost of goods sold. So I don't get to depreciate it. But if I want both, because we are pigs here, we want to get both. We want to get our depreciation and we want to get the benefits of being an active trader business, which that active trader business now, by the way, can do an accountable plan. It can reimburse me my uh, an administrative office in my home. It can give me cell phone. It can give me health. It can reimburse 100% of my medical, dental, and vision. It could do all sorts of cool stuff for me that I wouldn't be able to do. Um, if, well, and, I, and the other thing this does is it separates the, the real estate from the business. Mm -hmm. um, so if you if your Airbnb business gets sued, they can't get to that property. And there are cases of Airbnb businesses being sued for discrimination or for uh, misrepresentations or all sorts of stuff. You're keeping it separate now from the property. Somebody falls down, they're suing everybody. Falls down your stairs, you know. But uh, isn't that fun? Yeah. Well, see, I find this stuff fascinating. I hope you guys do too. But there is a way to do it that's right, where you're getting the best of both worlds. It just takes a little elbow grease. And I'm telling you, 99% of the accountants just don't get it. Um, so, oh, there's Carl Zellner, one of our attorneys. He says, I'm planning to do a new Airbnb video on 815. There has been some updates. Fantastic. So what we'll make sure is anybody who's listening to this, who sends this in, we are going to grab you all. And we are also going to have Carl give you that. Um, we'll make sure that you get it. There's lots of you guys out there asking for it. So uh, great. We hit, a, we hit a sore spot there. Good. All right. Can you invest the money earned through a 501c3 to invest in dividends and stocks? Well, yeah, you can. Uh, and they commonly do and put their uh, excess cash in different investments. Yeah. Uh, the thing you got to remember, though, is the purpose of the 501c3 and what ultimately you're doing with the funds in the 501c3. Yeah. So, uh, if you're putting a lot of money in the 501c3 and you're not actually accomplishing your mission because you're investing it all in stocks and other uh, bonds and other investments. Uh, like the California teachers here? Yeah, you might have a little issue there. Um, no, actually you could do it. So, so the, what it really comes down to is when you're in a 501c3, that's a fancy way of saying a charity. And that could be education, religion, health, uh, amateur sports. They all, there's a bunch of stuff. There's actually, a ton of different ways to qualify, but you're a tax exempt entity. So you always have to be worried in a tax exempt entity as to whether you cross over into something called unrelated business income tax. And so if you're in an active trader business, so let's say that the, the 501c3 runs a McDonald's, it's taxable. It's called unrelated business income tax. It's going to be taxable to you at corporate rates. Right. So that's called UBIT, and you're going to see that pop up in one of the questions later. I saw UBIT in there. Um, but there's portfolio income, rents, royalties, interest, and dividends. Um, and ca is capital gains part of portfolio? Capital gains. Capital gains, like, capital gains yeah. So rents is actually not portfolio. It's rents portfolio. But it's passive. Passive, right. So rents. So, so and we'll talk about that later. Royalties, interest, dividends, capital gains, which is what you get from stocks. Uh, all of those are passive and they are not UBIT. So a 501c3 can earn it and not have to worry as long as it's using it towards its charitable purpose. And so. And, and I would even argue that you have a fiduciary responsibility to the 501c3 to, uh, to invest that excess cash. But, but we are in a building right here in downtown Summerlin. We had to flee our rainbow location today because the ac went out and it's only 115 degrees or some ridiculous temperature um so we're here in the howard hughes company's downtown summerlin howard hughes corporation howard hughes put all of his money what was in the i forget what year it was like the 50s he transferred his companies into a 501c3 so the government could not take away control it's a horrible story, but then he sat on it for five years and they said, ha, 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 we got you. You took a huge deduction for transferring your company in there and it didn't do anything. And 
all it's been doing is paying you back a bunch of money on some loans that you, you supposedly gave it. The IRS lost. You know that case? No, I Five don't. years, they sat on it and did nothing. And I'm not giving you another dollar. <laughs> so it's just great. I love those cases. So it's Howard Hughes. And by the way, that is now, I think it's the third largest charity on the planet. They do over $580 million a year of medical research, but it didn't do it while he was alive. He had to die and get out of the way of it before they, they could make it do what he wanted. Um, but it's interesting. So when you have a 501c3, you don't pay tax, it grows. You're not paying tax on any of the dividends and, and, and stocks, but the, the downside is that if you need that money and it pays you a salary, it's all active ordinary income. It's not, you're not getting capital gains. You're not getting the long-term capital gains that you get off a dividend. So, you know, so the 501c3 yet yeah, doesn't pay tax. And if it's going in there for your charitable purpose, great thing, bless you for doing it. Yes. But it's probably not gonna give you any huge personal benefits. Um, you know, here's just a quick food for thought, just because the Tax Cut and Jobs Act screwed up a lot of your charitable giving. In fact, charitable giving last year was down for individuals because of this. Um, but you have that standard deduction that you have to exceed before you get the benefit from your charitable giving. So $24,000 if you're mailing, married, filing jointly. Um, so if you're gonna give money, or if you're gonna give things to a charity, what I would have probably do is I'd be giving stocks I'd be giving things that are highly appreciated. So if I have stock that I paid ten dollars for and now it's worth thirty, give them the stock so you don't have to pay tax on it. You don't have to sell it and then give them the money. Give them the stock, you get a thirty thirty dollar deduction. Let the charity sell that. It pays zero tax. Um, anyway, so there's another one. What is the tax on investment added to the college endowment funds in the last tax law? Oh, you're talking about if if so there's a tax that was added to, I think it hit six schools or something like that. If, you're, if your endowment fund was greater than, I think it was $180,000 per student, some dollar amount, then they charge like a 1% tax because schools like um, Harvard, they're exempt, they're nonprofits, and they literally pay nothing in tax and their endowments are growing faster than their costs are. So they just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think they have a ridiculous amount per year per student that the endowment could pay for. And again, I think it's like $180,000 a year. Like they literally would have to work really hard to start screwing up their finances. They don't need to charge people for school. Um, let's go on to the next one. I know what we're gonna do. We're gonna say, hey, this is a cool offer for you guys. It's a two for Tuesday offer. And what it is, is you get the TaxWise workshop, which is coming up, uh, I think it's November, the live workshop, which may be already sold out. Uh, you can get the live stream plus recording for sure. Uh, you get the recordings of all three 2019 workshops. We did one in June. We did one earlier in the year. Both of them were pretty awesome. Uh, but you get that. And we're going to give you the Bulletproof Investor Series, which is Two tickets to tax and asset protection workshop. That's a three day workshop where we go over all the different entities and a bunch of tax strategies and how to create a legacy. You're going to get Clint's book on real estate uh, asset protection or tax and asset protection for real estate investors. We're going to give you a three part. It's about a three hour series. It's probably closer to four hours. It's it's because every every one of them a little over an hour, but it's a three part video series on tax and asset protection and estate planning. And then a strategy session with an advisor or an attorney to create a wealth planning blueprint for you. Both of those together. There's one, we call it a two for Tuesday is $197. Um, guys, you do a little tax planning. And I, and I mean this, it's about the calculation we did internally is you get about $1,000 per hour return on tax um, like spending time on this, you, you'd be shocked at how much we can lower. The average amount that we were finding in extra deductions for folks, uh, and I kid you not, we ran 10 of them, 10 high net worth folks, and it was over $100,000 a piece. And then the average amongst the firm is right around, but it, and I'm gonna give you a, a larger gap, it's between 20 and $30,000. Is, is that a fair assessment, yeah, Jeff? It is. Yeah, so um, you can go through and uh, absolutely get a full-on 
like you'd be shocked at how much you will learn if you go through this. There's there's a three part video series. It's the uh, tax wise workshop, which is a two day workshop where we go over 30 tax strategies. You get two tickets to tax and asset protection and you get the book and you get the wealth planning blueprint. If you added those things up, just the tax and asset protection workshop tickets, uh, there's companies that sell that at five thousand dollars. I mean, I, I say that with a little bit of a chuckle, but that was actually what we sold for many, many, many years. You know, it's absolutely worth it by itself. The book is worth, you know, twenty nine dollars, but Clint thinks it's worth a million. Uh, the three part video series is worth a ton, and the strategy session, and then there's Tax Wise Workshop, which one client last workshop came back and had saved, uh, had a deduction of $178,000 after that, just on one strategy. And I'd tell you to take three away, but we had a cost segregation on a real estate professional for a doctor where they were able to get $178,000 deduction that wasn't there the year before. All right, so that leads us into something else. Can you explain the 100% depreciation changes in the new tax code and how they can best be used? Jeff, this. You may want to jump on this one because this is right in your wheelhouse. Yeah, well, this is talking about bonus depreciation primarily. Um, bonus depreciation allows you to deduct as an expense 100% of the cost of an asset. If it is a 15 year asset or less, uh, for example, computers are five years, uh, furniture and fixtures are seven years, and land improvements are 15 years. Mm -hmm. and certain, so and so. So all of those can be, uh, you can take 100% depreciation. Uh, now in 2023, it starts dropping off. In 2023, it drops to 80%. And then I believe by 2026, it drops down to 20%. Yeah, the, the easiest way to look at this is let's say you, you took a car and the IRS says your car is gonna last five years. So you're gonna divide it into five equal amounts if you just went under uh, what they call modified accelerated cost recovery system or MACRS, if you just went off of that, it's five year property. What bonus depreciation says is, hey, whatever amount you wanna take up to 100%, you take immediately. Now there are some rules on, on uh, cars, probably shouldn't use that as the greatest example, but if you have a luxury car or a passenger car, you're gonna have some other limits. But if you have a piece of equipment uh, like a truck, you could write off the whole thing in year one if you want to, or you could write off half, right? You could pick whatever amount you want to take as bonus depreciation up to 100%. Uh, the Tesla SUV, very expensive, and you can write that whole sucker off. That Tesla X, what Jeff said is absolutely true because it's heavy uh, and it's fast. Batteries weigh a lot. <laughs> yeah, well, you could write that whole thing off in year one. Now, that would also, if it's not 100% used for business, you're gonna get slapped with a pretty heavy tax hit. So, you know, so vehicles may not be the best example. Let's say we used a copy machine or some uh, equipment for your business, maybe a bunch of tools, or better yet, let's use the example I was just given, the $178,000 deduction. What you do is anything that's less than 20 years, you can write off in one year. So with real estate, a lot of folks don't realize that when you go under Mackers, which is uh, 29 and a half years for, 27, 27 and a half, half, excuse me, yeah, 39 years for commercial, 27 and a half years for residential. If you do that, that's treating it all like structure, but you can have an engineer go in there and say, it's not all structural, a lot of it is personal property, 1245 property, I think is what they call it which means like the carpet might be seven years, right? The paint, the fixtures on the walls, those might be five-year property. And they break it all down into, um, you can break it all down into pieces so that at the end of the day, and this is the average I've seen, is between 20 and 30% of the improvement value ends up being personal property that you can take immediate. Right. So let's say I buy a let's say I buy a um, a single family residence worth a million dollars, and it, maybe it's a duplex, fourplex, whatever, uh, or maybe it's a single family residence in California. <laughs> I think that's funny. Um, <laughs> and you have a, I actually just did one of these this morning. It was a hundred fifteen thousand dollar land, seven hundred fifty thousand dollars on the improvement. 
that 750,000 is going to generate somewhere between $200,000 in immediate deduction because they did a cost segregation because you can bonus depreciate that big chunk of land. Like guys, there's a tremendous amount of money if you do the cost segregation. And then the question is, can I use it? You know, so I get a huge deduction, but can I actually use it all? And um because it, it's passive activity. So unless I'm a real estate professional, I'm gonna be able to wipe out all of my other rents for a long time. But if I wanna wipe out my other income, I have to be a real estate professional. We've answered that question a million times in here. Uh, means that you're uh, 750 hours in a material participant in your real estate activity. Um, you do that, you can wipe out your spouse's other income. Like again, the, the example I gave 178,000, that was their bonus depreciation on one property. And if you own multiple properties, you could just pick one a year, do a cost seg, wipe it out. And then you can really control your taxes. It really gets fun, guys. Like mm -hmm. I'm talking about, you're, you're putting, uh, it, for that one client, it was about a, a little over $80,000 a year that they get to keep in their pocket. So the way I look at it is I just, you know, I'm just not me, but by, in, by making them aware, they were able to buy an extra house a year. And just in my little world, that's pretty huge for a family. If they do that for 10 years, that's pretty significant. So I think it's cool for something that was literally, they paid $197, I think, for their class. So I think that's a pretty good return on your investment. All right. Uh, I missed the part about the Airbnb in an escort. Can you then depreciate it? Hey. All right, we're going to give you the video on it. Tess. Uh, you don't depreciate it in the escort. The uh, real estate's held in a separate entity, and you you're the host. You lease it to your escort, and the escort is the host for seven days or less. So yes, you can depreciate it. Uh, you're going to get the best of both worlds. All right. I started an LLC and have no employees or income coming in. I'm married and file jointly. Can I claim business expenses on my taxes? What say you, Jeff? Uh, I, I sometimes have a problem with this because I sometimes see expenses just being churned away and there's not been really an effort to be profitable. Uh, so yes, you can deduct the expenses, but the longer you do this without any earning income, uh, the more risky it becomes uh, because then you're starting to look at the hobby loss rules. Mm -hmm. Hobby loss rules is section 183, which is only subjects to uh, sole proprietors, partnerships, S corps. And as an S corp, you can I mean like you can lose money. The first year, you can, uh, I'm just going to answer this real <coughs> straight. As a sole proprietor, partnership, or S corp, yeah, the expense, the business expenses are going to be offsetting, uh, are going to be a business expense that's going to offset your personal taxes. A C corp, you carry it forward. Um, you have no employees and no income coming in, but you just have loss. Then uh, in a C corp, you're just carrying it forward. Everything else, you're, you're either uh, if, if you're an S corp and you do not have basis, which I don't know how you incur a bunch of expenses without basis um, in a in a startup. I, you're going to get to write that stuff off. What Jeff is saying is don't do it more than two years in a row, because if you do it more than two years in a row, then they could say you're not really a business. But if you make three money, uh, if you make money three out of five years, then the presumption is you are a business. So you just have to make a little money after that. If you're going to lose money, you might want to just be a C corp because they don't ever have to make money. Hence, we have Amazon. Uh, somebody asked about the depreciation. Um, shouldn't the CPA know what depreciation should be taken, or at least make the the recommendation? The answer is no, Frank. You actually have to have a third party go in there and look at the property and tell them which part is 1245 uh, property versus 1250. I could not do it sitting here. I could give you the average, which is the average on, on residential is between 20 and 30 percent. On commercial, it's about 30 percent of the improvement value is what most engineers are coming back and saying that's the portion that's personal property. But again, Frank, it, unless you have somebody that's in real estate, like I'm in real estate. I have more than uh, 100 properties and I have commercial, I have, I have buildings and warehouse and I, like I, this, this is what we do. 
unless you have people like that, it's really tough because these are nuances. Jeff, right. you've been doing this for you know almost 30 yeah, years. I, I mean, there are some CPAs that may have that experience of, of being able to evaluate real estate, but it's going to be very far and few between. Yeah, and it's not a knock on them either. It's just that if, if they don't do it personally, it's probably <laughs> the way our memories work. And I'll just give you a test. If you start looking at like a truck, and let's say you look at a Raptor, Raptors are pretty cool. That's pretty dang. That's a that's a that's a kick butt Ford, right? Baja, like they go really really fast. Uh, if you start thinking of a Raptor and you start driving around, guess what you're going to see everywhere? You're going to see Raptors everywhere you turn. Or if you play Slug Bug, you know you start seeing them everywhere. That's the way our memory works as a human being. It's only relevant. There's actually a medical term for it. Somebody probably knows it, but most people it's not relevant so they don't see it so they could actually read it and they won't see it it won't sink in because it's not relevant to them it's like if i read an article about something in another place of the world that has nothing to do with me and it's their politics or something weird i'm probably not going to remember much of it because it's not relevant to me whereas if i read something in my town about my neighbors i'm probably going to remember it forever so um that's why when you're dealing with real estate you kind and I'm not going to say don't use your CPA. I'm never going to say that. If you have a good CPA, you give them hugs and kisses. What you do is you say, if you have somebody that doesn't see these, you probably want to either get them with us, have them take our course, or just get them onto the tax Tuesday asking questions and get it done. Um, obviously, we have a whole bunch of those folks, but we are really, yeah, there we go. The reticular activating system. Joe, you are a rock star because that's exactly what I was thinking. It's 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 your your mind. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to get into this. I spend way too much time on crap like that. All right. Um, so the answer is yes, you could take it. And then somebody says, what about the downside of depreciating personal property? If you recapture it, it's not the 25% recapture. It's ordinary income. However, keep in mind that personal property that gets depreciated, if it has no fair market value, it's not included in your gain which means everything becomes recapture or capital gains. You're not going to re recognize that as ordinary income. So like if I, if I have a um, commercial building with a bunch of carpet in it, we just had this was $248,000 worth of carpet. Well, I retired that after five years, 248,000. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I literally sat down, went over a scenario where they, they the engineer, they, the, uh, they didn't do a change order. So they had it in there as like 40,000. I was like, in your square footage, I don't know how you got carpet that cheap. So they went in and there was a change order. So it was an extra 200 and some odd thousand. The accountant caught it, not me. And um, and it was 248,000. And then they were going to go to sell the building and they were, they were yelling at the accountant saying, I'm gonna have ordinary income. And he said, no, because that has no value. When you sell it, it's a zero value. So you're not gonna have to recapture it. So again, this is why you have accountants that know what they're doing because they will save you. They are worth their weight in gold. A good CPA, a good EA, a good tax attorney, you just grab onto them and you hug them and you give them, send them chocolates and stuff because they will save you so much money. And I don't say that just because I need chocolate and because I'm a tax attorney. All right, are you familiar with the deferred sales trust concept? Yes, Rick, in fact, I, I know uh, the firm in Kansas City that really was paramount in that that topic and one of my friends was one of their lawyers who's out here in vegas now um i'm not going to bore everybody on it but it's a way of selling a high appreciated like a business and in spreading out the tax over a long term by selling it to by uh, by selling it under an installment note oftentimes with a skin self-canceling installment note and stepping up the basis and then selling it the following period of time most people will say six months later and not paying tax on that so you could have a 50 million dollar sale that you pay zero tax on and then you spread it out over your lifetime yeah rick that that they they do work and there's folks that are specialized in that i don't do them personally uh but i know the concept and i know the taxation of it and i could you know that's one of those things where i'd be referring you to somebody else and it's been the court and back it all works yep but there's a way to do it right and there's a way to do it wrong. Yep. And so you want to deal with somebody who's done them before. You don't want your, your person learning on it. So uh, I know enough to be very dangerous and uh, know some folks that'll do it. But if you're selling a, yeah, it's it, 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 it's cracker jack for someone who's exiting a businesses. Uh, <laughs> cognitive bias is also seeing more of the car you own. 
Tony Rock. Um, all right. Uh, da, 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 structuring an LLC series for privacy. Wyoming holding LLC must be formed before all others. E, kind of. Wyoming doesn't even report anything anymore, so you could actually do the whole thing and be pretty safe. Um, all right, let's go on to this. We have several single family, so they say SA, it's single family resident properties that need to be put in LLCs. Do they each get their own LLC? So I'm going to do good, better, best. Good is making sure that your properties are separated from you. So at least having one LLC. So if a house burns down and people are hurt, they don't garnish your wages till you're dead. If you don't think that can happen, rest assured, I garnished one gal. She uh, just, she, she, it, it was in Washington state in 1997 and she trashed a friend of mine's house on her way out. The, the gal's son was dealing drugs out of the property and she was very angry that this landlord said that her son was dealing drugs out of the property. So she took a ball hammer and busted a bunch of holes throughout the, the deal. And this guy was not super rich. He was, he'd worked his whole life and he had rental properties as a retirement. So he was a friend of a friend. A lot of you guys know my story, but I took the case pro bono, which means you don't get paid and you just go after these people. So it was intentional. Act. You can't bankrupt it. So we sued. I, I did a leasehold trouble damages claim in Washington state. If you damage a leasehold, you could actually get trouble damages. The lawyer didn't understand it. Judge did, judge awarded. Um, we ended up with a 50 some odd thousand dollar verdict against this gal who immediately went into bankruptcy, thought she could defeat it. And we pursued it in bankruptcy and got it, avoided the uh, the bankruptcy. And then we followed her around and garnished her. She worked for Boeing for many, many years. It took us 11 years to collect that entire judgment. But we collected every dollar plus interest. It's 12% interest. So, um, if you don't want that happening to you, and this is like, if you're if you're doing something bad, then we're not gonna help you. But if you're just, you have a property and somebody says, hey, I have a toxic mold and you get evil lawyer who takes it and tries to sue you for a million bucks, that's gonna keep you up at night. The LLC will protect that. Uh, better is when you have your LLC, multiple LLCs, where you have properties in various LLCs. So you might take four or five and put them in an LLC, depending on the value of the properties. So um, a lot of times what we talk about is how much equity is available in those properties and do I wanna cut it off? So if like, let's say you're a doctor and you're making a lot of money and you go and you buy a property in Indiana for a hundred grand and you say, what's the worst that could happen to me? They could garnish your, your medical wages to, forever. So you put an LLC around it. Okay, what's the worst that could happen? They take that property away. What if I have 10 properties? Well, let's say I put five in one LLC and five in another. Then I have a fire on one of them, a huge liability, or I get sued for mold on one of them. Then I, I, I'm gonna lose five, but it's really the equity in those five. If I have a loan against them all, then I really don't have to worry about it. Best is one, L, one property in each LLC. But it gets, again, you have to do cost benefit. If it's, let's say it's apartment buildings, it's a no brainer. One LLC per apartment building. If it's single family residences and they're $25,000 each and like, you know, it's not much value in it, it'll cost more to foreclose on it. I'm probably putting a few of those in an LLC. Yep. But if I have a bunch of decent properties and they're going to keep appreciating, I'm just going to start right from the get go and I'm just going to do LLCs. And if I'm in a state like California where I have a franchise tax on each LLC of 800 bucks, then I'm going to take that into consideration. I'm either going to move them out of the state and use trust or I'm going to do something to make sure that I'm protected. Uh, somebody said, I saw Clint Coons on YouTube video about holding property and living trust to avoid probate. Yep. In many other videos that it's always uh, own income property in LLC. So please help me understand, how do you own a property in LLC and hold it in the living trust? Um, so Casey, an LLC um, is kind of like putting it in a, in a, it is putting your shaving cream in a plastic bag and your living trust is your luggage. So let's say that I'm gonna go on a trip somewhere and I'm gonna bring shaving cream, but I have really nice suits Maybe my wife has some really nice clothing and I just put my shaving cream just right into the suitcase and zip it up. 
Well, first off, the living trust is just a, a convenient holding vehicle for all my clothing. It's great. And if if I pass away, I don't have to distribute the clothing. I just say, hey, somebody, let's say my trustee, I say, could you please keep my clothes in this suitcase? And if my kids need it, take give them what they need out of it. Um, so, so that's how a living trust works. But that shaving cream could still explode and destroy all my clothing. So the LLC concept is basically to put it in a Ziploc. So if that shaving cream blows up, it stays inside the Ziploc bag. And if I open up my, my suitcase and I see that my shaving cream has exploded, it's going to be confined to that bag and I throw that bag away. That's your LLC. So I may have a whole bunch of shaving creams and I just put them in the uh, suitcase. It's not a big deal. That's what your LLCs are. Somebody else says, um, would you recommend a series LLC for multiple rentals? In the state where the that has a statute, there's 14 states that have series LLC statutes, I believe. Um, but uh, it's like if you're like in Texas or Wyoming or some of these places where they have pretty decent statutes and I know that their judges aren't just going to ignore them, then I would do it. Um, so the liability in each LLC is only for the equity? Yep. They get the good and the bad. So if you have a piece of property that has a loan against it, toss it in an LLC, the most they could get is the difference between the fair market value and that loan. That's how we force settlements. 99.9% .9 of the time, guys, we, we just don't see our clients ever go to trial. In fact, I've seen 30 plus million dollar disputes. I've seen 100 plus million dollar disputes on two occasions involving our clients. None of them went to, none of them ever went to, went to uh, trial. They all get settled out because there's a cap on what they're able to get. And you're, and you're basically saying, I'm going to spend it down. And that has a really, that's going to be a better way to, to force people to do it. So uh, you had a second question. Is there uh, some tax and legal benefit to holding the properties in an LLC versus living trust? No. So the LLC, we, we first do no harm with an LLC. We want to get all the benefits of holding real estate. The living trust is ignored. So Casey, that living trust, again, it's just your luggage and you're putting stuff in it. All your personal assets and all your business assets are going in that luggage. It's not there for anything other than to make sure it's easy for your family to keep control of it or those you care about or organizations you care about and it does not have to go through probate. Uh, who can set up the living trust and actually understands this method? My estate attorney and I feel is behind in this area. Yeah, Casey, call us up. We have folks, we can help you anywhere you are. So. Uh, AO is better to hold loans on the property are owned by the LLC or pay them. Oh, is it better to hold loans in the properties? I'm a big believer that when you put prop, when you put property into an LLC, it's great to have a loan against it. Even if it's your own company, we call that a friendly lien. Loan yourself the money to buy it. So you're keeping your cash. It's, I call it a virtual safe. So I don't want to get too long winded on this because I've already gone over, but uh, the way I explain it, is you're walking down the street at night and you can see right into people's houses, right? Peeping Tom. No, like Maybe it, you can. Yeah. You walk down and if, and if they're lit up, you can see right into their houses. And just imagine that their door was open and they had a pile of cash right there by the front door that you could see wherever you walked. You don't want people to see your cash and leave the door open. They're just going to go help themselves. Not you, obviously, because you're a good person, but there's people on this planet that would just without even a hesitation, walk in there and take it. So you can close the door and turn the lights out, but the cash is still sitting there. If somebody goes into your house, they still take your cash. And you say, well, I could put it in a safe. Were well, you talking to a guy who actually had a safe stolen out of his house after I had my windows replaced? About two weeks later, somebody came back in and got my safe. So the safe can still be taken. So what do you do? Um, you, you basically take it and you bury it in the desert where nobody can see it or find it. Now nobody can take it. That's a good place to put your cash, except you don't want to go out in the desert and bury it. So you use Wyoming or Nevada where they can't see that you own it. And it's basically a virtual safe. You're putting your cash in there and then you loan it to yourself and you lean your properties. And if anybody ever comes after you, guess who gets paid first? Your virtual safe. And they can never take that from you. In Nevada and in Wyoming, they have charging order statutes, which means nobody can take your asset. The most they could do is slap a lien on it and it's worth nothing. In fact, you could actually usually scare them off because you say, hey, um, I'm going to hit you with the tax bill. 
and there's there is one ruling on it that's favorable to that so most people don't mess with it um it's enough to make them scared who knows you may dig up a body by mistake stop that robert yeah we don't put bodies in our safes it's just bad uh but you put your cash in there uh could i do a friendly lien on a property held in a self-directed ira uh not from you or or a disregarded uh person but yes uh you could but you run into UBIT issues. So I wouldn't use a self-directed IRA. This is actually getting way ahead of us because we have a question on this at the end. You can have debt in a 401k, you cannot have debt in a self-directed IRA without incurring debt finance income. Da -da -da. So yes, you can, but uh, I don't wanna work and get more information. Hey, Casey, if you like this stuff, do the Bulletproof Investor, the two for Tuesday. Um, maybe Susan or Patty can send that link out. It's really cool. I don't even think I put a link out. I just said you guys can get it. They'll send you a link. It'll be part of the follow-up email or they'll send it while we're talking. Maybe they already did. Let me look. That's the A part. Oh, look at this two. Yeah, there it is. It's in there. So if you want to learn this stuff, it doesn't take that long. It's actually really cool. Um, and it works like a charm. Again, I've been doing this for 20 plus years, Jeff, almost 30 years. And I can tell you that when you do things right, you don't get sued, you don't get harassed, you don't get audited. We see almost no audits. Jeff, how many of our clients have you? Like we do over 5,000 returns a year. How many audits did you see last year? One or two. Of our clients, right? Of our, of our clients, yes. Yeah, we, get, we, we see lots from others. <laughs> okay, can you explain the 100% depreciate? Wait, I already answered that one. Uh, what am I doing? Maybe I redid that over. Uh, if I move into one of my rentals for a year and a half, that's in its own LLC. Does the LLC still depreciate and deduct repairs? And the answer is no, yeah. uh, simply because it's not available to be rented. Uh, and it's also become your personal residence for the time being. Uh, so I might argue that you could deduct any mortgage interest and taxes on your personal return, but Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the LLC, the rental property is not going to be able to deduct anything and during that time. Yeah, the beautiful answer is no, you can't depreciate it. When it's personal property, you don't depreciate personal property. If it's a rental, like let's say it's a duplex, then you're going to write off half. If it's a single family resident where you just move into it, then it's personal property. But you stay in it for six more months you can actually get the exclusion, the 121 exclusion, which for an individual is 125,000 against the capital gains or, or 250,000. Wait, it's 250,000? 250 single 500. Yeah, 250 American. single 500. I don't know where I'm getting that 125. Uh, 250 single $500,000, yeah, where you don't have to pay tax on the capital gains. So it's huge. Now, if I was planning on returning this to a rental property after a year and a half, I would probably capitalize those repairs and start depreciating after like rent it again. Mm -hmm. Yep, you're gonna go. You're gonna go grab it. I'm gonna grab those repairs and yep. say there are improvements or whatever I need to do. Yep. Somebody says, if I'm a platinum member, do I get to get in for free in November? America. That's a great name. That's my daughter's name, by the way. America Marie. So uh, don't get to see too many Americas. I don't know. I think you do. I think that if you ask, that we'll get you in for free uh on the uh on just the live but if you want all the uh recordings and all the live stream and all that other stuff you have to do the little offer um but yeah we give you tickets all the time to come and spend time with us the uh structural implementation workshop tax and asset protection if you're platinum we give you tickets uh can you use a wyoming series LLC to own properties in other states ha 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 Yes, Koya, what you do is you have a land trust in your local state and you take the beneficial interest and you put it in each of the series. It's kind of a mean trick, um, but it actually works like a charm. So there's lots of ways to do it. Can I deduct educational training costs pertinent to the company mission with an LLC framework if I file as a C Corp? This is my new favorite person. And your answer is? Absolutely. That's the beautiful part. If it's part of my, uh, if it's gonna benefit the employer, I can write it off. So anything that helps me in my job with the uh, C Corp, which is the LLC tax to the C Corp. So if I work for the C Corp, I am now a uh, employee. And if I am doing things that can reimburse me those costs or pay for them direct. Absolutely. Anything you wanna add on that one? No. See, I've, I've been flapping my gums so much that we're way over. So I'm gonna skip through that one. Ta -da. All right, 
How do we structure our healthcare through our corporation to be able to write things off like gym memberships and doctor visits? Can't even help but laugh a little bit when I say gym. Uh, yeah, a little clarification on that. Um, doctor visits you can deduct, gym memberships are not deductible. They're reimbursable, but they're not deductible to the corporation. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes also for any over-the-counter medications or supplements uh, and certain other uh, health benefits. But uh, yeah, this would actually be structured through a 105 plan. So if you're an S Corp, it's taxable to you. Yes. And you can write off the insurance premiums only. If you're a C Corp, you write the whole thing off. Right. And uh, the gym membership, that's going to be a tough one unless you have a doctor's prescription. Yeah, that that's, that's usually comes under what they call a wellness program. You got to get your doctor friend to say you need a gym membership. Jeff, I'm going to prescribe you. I'm a doctor. I'm a JD. A yeah. junior doctor? <laughs> I always tell, I used to tell my daughter that. I said, I think I'm licensed to do small procedures. Sure, doctor. Yeah, sure, doctor. Uh, somebody says, is the cost $35 a month to become a platinum member? Uh, that's what it costs once you become a platinum member. There's a small initiation fee unless you're uh, doing, like if you do an entity, chances are it's not going to cost you anything. Um, I would reach out to somebody here and see what, 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 what it is. Exactly, what am I doing with my Alaska cruise? Um, right off my C Corp for financial education. So if you're going on a cruise, now here's the deal, and this is for Sherry. Uh, when you go on a cruise, that's travel. You can't actually write off cruises. I mean, there's a way to do it. It has to be a U.S. registered vehicle, I mean, a vessel, and there's only two of them. I think they're in Hawaii. But if it visits a foreign port, um, you do not get to deduct that. So what you, what you, what you can do is write off cruise travel that's going to to a place so if you're on a cruise chances are you guys are getting off at another location and actually having a meeting you can write off up to twice the maximum federal per diem rate per day as part of your cruise um and yep we're doing the land seminar to validate it yep that's how you do it probably uh the ex irs trial attorney if i'm not mistaken mr mr scott that's probably teaching that uh, let me see if I'm right. That would be Scott. Yes, it's surprising that an ex IRS trial attorney would be. Yes, no, yeah, actually, Scott's a great guy. Um, and yep, yeah, he knows what he's doing. So he's telling those guys how to do it right. And if you like doing cruises, start using it as travel. So it's about 800, 900 bucks a day, depending on what the maximum federal amount is. And uh, yeah, you can use it to get places. So you don't have to take a plane, you don't have to take a boat. You don't have to take a train. You can, you can take a horse if you really want to, but um, any of those, you get to write it off. The IRS doesn't get to tell you how to get there. You can drive a car. You can do whatever. If you want to take luxury air, uh, water travel, it's the max. And then here's a little trick. Um, make sure that if you are doing a, using a cruise travel, that the meals are included uh, because then you don't have to do the 50% meals. If it's included in the uh, accommodations, then it's all deductible. All right, I am retired drawing social security and retirement. Do I need to pay myself a salary for my corporation and all of the associated withholding of federal and state taxes, or would I be able to simply pay myself a distribution of the profits? So I understand what you're doing with social security and retirement. You do not want to give yourself more income because it makes your social security taxable. The answer is you don't need to pay yourself a salary. If you do pay yourself money out of it, a distribution of a dividend or a distribution, then you probably are going to have to pay yourself a salary. So you're going to want to see what's the most efficient way to get the money out and whether it's better to be an S Corp or a C Corp. Uh, in your situation, it's probably going to be a C Corp. And there's so many ways to get the money out tax free. I'm going to say that's going to be your better bet. And, and if you've taken early Social Security, and you're not a full retirement age, I would strongly suggest that you not take payroll uh, because every dollar you earn in payroll reduces your social security benefits. Yeah, I would. I don't want payroll. But does does the does the distribution out of an S corp jump that? No, up? I don't think that does. Yeah, so uh, certain because passive it's not considered income. earned income. Yeah, passive income is not going to mess with your social security. So, so here's the answer. It goes back to something I said earlier, which anything in tax has three rules. That's calculate, calculate, calculate. 
you really want to sit down with your with a tax person and, and run the numbers. Um, and somebody says, uh, I should also mention that the family member is retired and collecting Social Security. Yep. Yeah, then you want to make sure. Uh, boy, some weird stuff. I have a C Corp with accumulated $100,000 loss. Close the corp and buy properties in LLC. Oh, here's the beautiful part. So James, you just asked a question. And so here's what he says. I have a C Corp with accumulated $100,000 loss. If you're married filing jointly, you can take that loss personally if you dissolve the corporation. Uh, assuming, I'm going to say assuming you made a 1244 stock election, which you do if you're if it's a small corporation, chances are you already did that. And it's an Inc, not an LLC. Yeah, it has to be a corporation, a traditional C Corp. But then you'd be able to write off the uh, the 100,000. Somebody says calculate, calculate, calculate and depends. Option profit cost me Social Security. Options profit cost me Social Security income. So, uh, Johnny, you were probably doing short term, and you, they, they, I don't know if they did. They make you a uh, did they make you a trader? Well, what what they probably did was um, because of his income and the options. He didn't. Yeah, he wasn't a trader. It increases his Medicare cost. So the more you make, the more they charge you for Medicare. Yeah. But he said Social Security. He cost me Social Security income. Well, and then the Medicare is deducted from Social Security. All right. So that's why they got him on that. Boy, we have a whole bunch of uh, questions. What's the best business credit card uh, to use as a startup for an LLC? I'd use American Express because they don't report to your personal. Uh, somebody says, what is the best way for to pay a family member 10% of gross rents on a monthly basis for their compensation for loaning money? So that sounds like interest. Yeah. It was purchased a uh, home equity loan to be repaid by the property rents. Uh, LLC taxes, C corporate manage the property, family members retired and collecting social security. I'd pay them then without any doubt. I'll just tell you the gross rent. What I would do is I would, I would make this a participating loan that says 10% of in, you know, interest capped at 10% um, of gross rents. So you're making it kind of contingent on the collection. And all it's going to do is it's still interest and it won't hurt your social security. See, easy answer to that one. All right, let's keep going on. What happens if a real estate property is gifted to an immediate family member and the recipient sells the gifted property within two years? So first off that two year period, I'm not aware of there being anything with gifts. I am aware of a 1031 exchange that you sell to a related party. They have to hold it for two years. But the question is, does the tax liability fall on the donor? Or does the recipient just file it on the recipient's return? So is, are, you, are you aware of any two-year? Well, you know what this might be? It's the 121. Mm. If, they're used, if, they're, if I gifted you a property and then you lived in it for two years. That could be. I'm trying to figure it out. Maybe it's something uh, that I'm not aware of. I'll have to look at this one a little bit. But here's the deal. Gifted property, you get their basis. So I'm thinking that what if I'm in a really high tax bracket and I give the, the property to one of my kids and they sell it immediately? Is it attributed back to the gift door? No, it's um, like you said, you get the basis of the mm -hmm. gift door uh, and you pay the tax on it. Yeah. Um, I don't think I've seen anything though. That I don't remember. I don't, I've never seen anything about two years on gifted property, but I could just be the only one I'm aware of is the 1031 exchange two year. So we may have to look that one and see if there's anything. I don't think there's an issue. And I'd just say the recipient would file it on their return and they get the basis of the party that gifted it. So if I if I bought it, like let's say grandma bought this property, depreciated the heck out of it, and uh, it has $10,000 basis and it's worth $300,000 and they gift it to you, and then you sell it, your basis is grandma's basis of $10,000. Now, one other thing you need to be aware of is if you're gifted – perhaps rental real estate mm -hmm. and there's passive losses on it. You don't get those passive losses. They, they stay, they stay with the uh, uh, gifter, the grantor. Um, mm -hmm. And they don't get to recognize those passive losses either until you sell that property. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a catch if there's loss, suspended losses on a rental property. And somebody said, are there any other usual tax consequences, consequences or penalties? I'm not aware of any there because you're, you, somebody is going to pay the tax. CPA said the IRS might see it as a transfer of income. That's the only thing I could think of is if you immediately sell it, uh, 
specifically to somebody in a much lower tax bracket than you, mm -hmm. like your kids. Yeah, that I'm. I'm gonna look. <laughs> I'm gonna say let's let's take a uh, let's take a look at this and we'll hold it over till the next time. Uh, it's just a depreciation improvements. Is a period of time after before the gift of the donor. No. Uh, it's James again, I'm not married, so is there a way to recoup the loss of my personal return? James, you'd, you'd get a $50,000 as a single person on a, with, with that much of loss. I'm gonna have to say that we're gonna, we're, we're gonna have to postpone that one. I wanna look at it. I'm not aware of a two-year, and I think the tax liability is just gonna be yours. Um, if, because remember, the income goes to you. Now, if you gift it back within two years, I bet you there's a period where they say we're gonna undo the gift. So if I transfer it to my kid, my kid sells it, pays a lot less tax, and then gifts it back to me, then I think that I'm, then now I have an issue. They're just going to look through that transaction as a step transaction. Uh, that's about, uh, hmm, that's annoying. I don't know off the top of my head. We'll have to look at that one again. Uh, how do I start funding a solo 401k? This is a great idea, by the way. So a solo 401k has three buckets. It has the employee deferral bucket, which this year, I think it's 19,500 if you're under 50. Let me look. You know what it is off the top well, of your I head? I want to say 18,500, but I could be wrong. No, I think it's at least, it's no, excuse me, 2019 is 19,000. There's a catch up of $6,000 if you're over 50. So if you're 50 or over, I should say, by the end of the uh, year. And the catch up never changes. Ketchup never changes. So you could put up to $25,000 deferred, which means the company pays you $25,000, but you don't receive the $25,000. It goes right into your 401k. That's deferral. So that's bucket number one. Bucket number two, company can match 25% of whatever you receive and, uh, or, and, and deduct it. So if I pay you $50,000 of salary, I could put another 12,500. So let's just say I paid Jeff 50 grand. He can defer, you're over 50? Yep. So Jeff can defer 25,000, plus the company could put another 12,500 for a total of 37,500 on his salary of 50 grand. That's a pretty good way to get money in there. Last bucket is the Roth 401k bucket which is again that catch up in the uh, in the 19,000. So if I don't want to take a deduction for my deferral, I could just stick it right into my Roth. In my Roth 401k. And by the way, I could I could actually get up to my entire compensation in there if I stick a bunch of money into the 401k's 401a bucket, which is the the employer match part. Then I could roll that all in, during the year into a Roth IRA. This is really twisted. Uh, but the whole amount can go into the Roth IRA. It is called an in-company distribution, in-service distribution. And I can get the whole amount into a, uh, I get that whole amount into a Roth IRA. Did I hear the green sheet crumpling? Yes, you did, Al. See, that's why we keep around our cheat sheets. And uh, I love them. All right, we got a, one more question and we're way over, but... Do solo 401ks have to pay UBIT or UDFI if they finance real estate? So let's go over what those concepts are. UBIT, do you want to hit that or do you want me to knock that? Um, what's the U stand for? <laughs> I just, unrelated. Like, unrelated business income tax. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a tax at solo 401ks, 501c3s, and certain other exempt organizations. IRAs. In, Roth, in, any kind of exempt in, uh, organizations mm -hmm. or entities, uh, they pay uh, this tax on uh, trade or business income. Mm -hmm. uh, so the important thing is how trade or business income is defined. Um, interest, dividends, capital gains, mm -hmm. the, that's all portfolio income that is not trade or business. Yep. Um, so, so, so the example. Real, real estate rentals is not. Trader right. business. Right. So it has to be an active trader business. So if I am doing business that was competitive to a an active business, with the ex there's a few exceptions, by the way. Like if you have a thrift store as part of your church, they're going to let you do it. But if I open up a McDonald's owned by my church, 
that McDonald's is paying tax, even if it's owned by your church. It's unrelated business income tax. It's unrelated to the charitable, the exempt purpose. And you pay UBIT on any exempt entity, period. There's no a way to get around UBIT just because I'm doing an active business in my exempt organization. Now, UDFI is when you do unrelated debt finance income. So if you're doing finance, so if you're doing real estate, that's not UBIT. Real estate is passive. If you borrow money on real estate, a 401k is not subject to UDFI. In, an IRA is, and the way you look at it is if I borrow $50,000 to buy a $100,000 piece of property, so my, my IRA puts in 50 and I borrow 50, and that property generates $10,000 during the year, 5,000 of it or half is unrelated debt finance income, and I have to pay tax on that 5,000. I do not have to do that if it's a solo 401k. That's a huge difference. For those of you who do syndications, that solo 401k is what you should be using to do a syndication. You should not use an IRA to do syndications because that IRA is subject to the unrelated debt finance income. And if you do a syndication, chances are they're using leverage. For example, in a, uh, in, in, let's just use a common situation. I raise $2 million and I get a, uh, a $5 million loan on an apartment complex to fix it up and get it operating. I have so much unrelated debt finance income now. And you think, oh, I, this is great. I got it in my IRA. No, you're supposed to pay tax on it. In fact, two-sevenths of it, whatever that equals, um, is taxable. Or no, five-sevenths of it is taxable. So that's a big chunk. More than half is going to be subject to that tax if it's in an IRA. So you make sure it's going through a 401k. Um, somebody says, I did not get the answer to the question about the $100,000 loss in the C Corp. I answered it. Uh, but I'll just tell you that the $100,000 loss you could take personally, Adele, if you close that corporation, if you're married, filing jointly. If you're single, then it's $50,000. So your your corporation, your your accountant is probably saying, let's kill the corporation, take that loss personally, and then invest in real estate through a different entity. And I agree with them. Depending on what your income is, let's say you're making 100, 100 grand, you're going to wipe out your tax bill. You're going to have a zero tax this year. Um, Somebody says, can I set up a solo 401k if my income is 1099 INT and K1 from real estate estate syndications? The answer is yes, depending on what type of income you're getting from the K1. It, the 1099 INT, wait, is that interest? That's interest. Then you can't. Yeah, so it has to be active income that's going into the 401k. What you can do is you could have, again, you'd have a C Corp managing an LLC holding those pieces of income, and you'd pay the C Corp and then the C Corp could fund your retirement plan. So you can actually do that. You can, you have to shift it a little bit. But uh, it, the, what do they say? The juice has to be worth the squeeze. Yes. So it's gotta be worth it. Um, it's gotta be, it's, you know, you do your calculation, it's gotta be worth it. All right, guys, uh, last little piece here. I'm just gonna give you guys a few little things. Don't forget, two for Tuesday. Take advantage of this if you want. Some of you guys have probably already done the TaxWise workshop, and I know there was already a couple questions. Here's my here's the gift. If you did that TaxWise workshop, and this is going to tick off my people, I would just include the bulletproof. I still think it's absolutely a fantastic value, and I'm not going to punish you if you, if you bought early on the TaxWise workshop because we had that for $197. So I would say you get both. Uh, we'll grandfather you in because again, because we care about you, we want you to be successful. So we want you to get all the assets that you can and we're not one of those companies that sits there and worries about the nickels and dimes when there's dollars out there that you guys could be making um itunes go onto our podcast you can listen to this stuff while you're working out that's what i usually do uh driving around again what i usually do i'm getting used to what to, to doing my podcast as opposed to listening to the radio um and the workshop and the yeah the, you basically this was you get everything there um we just throw it on in there let's see are there times when an s corporation would be preferable to a c corp for instance in wholesaling davida absolutely so it depends on whether you're going to use that money or whether you're just stockpiling and what your tax bracket is so again we have to calculate how do we get the bulletproof if we already have the 1097 tax wise live stream uh email us and uh we will annoy the heck out of patty and susan 
That's what our job is. I'm not going to talk to you for the rest of the week. No, and I, I know we talked about this, and I don't remember what the answer is, so I'm just going with give it away. Um, somebody says, can I pay my daughter out of the LLC as a contractor? Yes, so she can cover expenses while she is attending college. Yes, that's what we teach, America. You're absolutely perfect. I will have to fill out the W-9. Can I deduct it as a business expense? Yes. You're nailing it. She's getting it. You're already all over it. It's better to have it in her tax bracket. Um, I mean, you're going to count the number of it depends, we said. That's you're mean, Sherry. Have a good time on your Titanic. Um, <laughs> we hope you make it back. Hi. Uh, all right. So the Google Play podcast. Um, say hey to Don for me, by the way. He cracks me up. And Scott and all those guys. Google Play, that's the same thing. You get the free podcast. If you need the replays of all your uh, of all these, and again, we have tons and tons of them. I think we're into the 90s now. You can go in and uh, the Platinum Portal, you can get access to them. And then, of course, make sure that you're going on to um, Anderson Advisors forward slash Facebook and forward slash YouTube. If you want to keep learning this stuff, you can you can find a lot of answers to your questions uh, just by going in there and uh, subscribing and makes us happy. Uh, questions, you can always send them in, Tax Tuesday at Anderson Advisors, or visit us on andersonadvisors.com. If there's nothing else, then I'm going to say thank you, guys. There was a lot of really good questions tonight. Um, we always enjoy doing this. Uh, I can speak for myself. It's a lot of fun, and you guys are a really great group to, to work with, so it's a lot of fun. So you guys have a great night, and then we'll see you again in about two weeks. Two weeks. We'll see you. Thank you, Jeff. By the way, you did a great job. Thank you. Thank you.